Um, the title of my talk is Muddy Waters in the Minnesota River Blues. Um, it's, a, it's a common understanding that this is a muddy river, and I want to set the stage geologically and explain why. Um, this is one of my favorite landscapes in Minnesota. These were supposed to be animated so you could see them a little bit at a time. You know, the beautiful flowers that bloom out here, the lovely oaks, the bluff on the Yellow Medicine River. But there are times of year when you do end up with chocolate milk looking rivers. This is Alexander Ramsey Park in Redwood Falls in June. And then, of course, we know that the confluence of the Minnesota with the Mississippi shows the contrast very starkly after blood's coming out of these rivers. This is an elevation model of the watershed. You are here. I can talk about the bend, but not today. But what we have is really a landscape that has had this. If you think of this as a piece of woven fabric, somebody pulled a thread out of the middle of it 14,000 years ago. And it has been unraveling into the landscape. And so we have this kind of raw edge there in the middle that is meant to evolve over time, but there are land practices in place that are accelerating what's happening. So now I'm going to take you back to set the stage for how this was created. We had an ice advance that went all the way down to Des Moines, Iowa, and took its name from Des Moines. And basically, you know, a glacier with lakes in front of it, maybe streams flowing away from it, that spackled the landscape with something that looked a lot like wet cement. This is a the furthest south that the ice sheet got, and it was a very late advance of ice as well. They advanced into mature forests in the Des Moines area. So it's unusual, and I studied it just for that unusual dynamics. It's also unusual in where the source, again, man, even were here, where the source of that ice was. It's really interesting in the way it kind of switched places where it was drawing ice, and you can kind of see the paths. Looks like somebody dragged, it, dragged their fingers through the frosting in North America. That is the path of the ice, um, and that's the source for the materials that are now scrapped across our landscape. And because of the different rocks that the glacier came over, we have a crushed mixture of these materials. There's a little bit of limestone, a lot of gray shale from the Dakotas, and then a tiny bit of petrified wood I found in the till the glacial sediment, and then only a little bit of like granites, and a lot of those are picked up locally in the Minnesota River Valley. And so what you end up with is this mixture. It's very well mixed at the bottom of the glacier, and then it is left behind in a layer, usually on a, the order of a few meters thick at a time, and that just gets stacked. If you've seen any of the exposures of the rivers around here, you'll see those either gray or yellow-brown units. Once they're exposed to oxygen, either through oxygenated water or just the atmosphere, they turn kind of yellow-brown. The color of car parts. It's a good match. As the ice advanced and retreated, it also created little dams and had temporary lakes on the landscape. These are not here now. Um, they existed for on the order of decades, down in the Blue Earth watershed, and in the, um, this is basically Redwood Falls to Ortonville, that lake. And then, of course, our very large Glacial Lake Agassiz. And it was the drainage of Glacial Lake Agassiz that started us on the course of pulling that thread out of the middle of the landscape. But these other lakes play a role in what's happening in the landscape today, too. So imagine here, we had a glacier parked in North Mankato, and the lake extended to the south of us, uh, covering all of Blue Earth County. And we had deltas on the west side of it coming in from the uh, Watnorn and Cottonwood Rivers into that lake, delivering sands, but also a lot of suspended fine silted clay that eventually settled out and created this really flat landscape, which you might not appreciate as a flat landscape, but it is flat without that center um, trough. This was a massive lake, and it profoundly affected the climate of North America at this time, um, depending on where the water went when it drained out our way. Um, it was the Gulf of Mexico, and you can recognize that in the shells of the creatures that were being created at the time that changed what they are, what the shells were made of. When it drained to the North Atlantic, it sent Europe back into an ice age for a few hundred years. Um, we don't, the Arctic drainage is kind of a new discovery. We don't really appreciate the impact that had. And if you go to the western part of the state, that elbow in Minnesota, 
where um, Lake Traverse and Big Stone Lake meet. This is where the southern outlet was. And it, you can almost hear the giant sucking sound of water moving through there. It just looks like it was a wall of water coming through that area. These are children from the local school that were trying to appreciate that. So this is the thread that was pulled 13,000 years ago. There was a sudden and catastrophic event, geologically speaking. Probably happened on the order of decades and might have happened more than once, the drainage through the southern outlet. It's hard to tell because these are erosive events. They remove the evidence of what happened before. But if you drop the central part of this gentle trough 100, 200 feet, then all of the rivers entering it are suddenly waterfalls. And so they have to somehow adjust their gradients to this sudden lowering. The waterfalls don't persist. They will relax over time, or they'll kind of march back in a stepwise fashion. So you know there are still some waterfalls around here. Maybe you'll visit the Yoko Falls later today. And there are other falls on the north side. Um, where there's bedrock close to the surface, you'll end up with a waterfall. Um, and then you also recognize, this is um, looking back towards St. Peter on the uh, preserve on the north side of the valley. You also appreciate that there's this huge valley out there, and the Minnesota River is this tiny river inside of it. So it's not the river that created the valley. It is just the rain that's now occupying that central lobe. So it is unable to carry away the material that's been delivered. I'm going to focus on this Lesseur River watershed, which is the one south of us. Um, a friend of mine who worked on this with me called it the beating muddy heart of the Minnesota River Basin. It is kind of heart shaped. This is what the river profiles looked like on average before that central thread was pulled. So we're looking at profiles of the Cobb, the Maple, and the Soar. Um, these are wonderful canoeing streams if you want to get on that river. I see Mark Bosacker is here, and he's with the Mankato at Paddling and Outing Club, and they take wonderful trips on these rivers when the flow is right. It's harder, doesn't it, Mark, to figure out when you can get on these rivers. But these rivers started up at this elevation, and then they want to end up here. This is how far they've adjusted their gradients in the last 13,000 years. So the lower reaches of these rivers are these steep, block-lined stretches. Sometimes you see bedrock. They're really gorgeous. You don't realize you're in an agricultural landscape when you're down in these. And then there is what we call a nick point, or a step. There's another nick point way up in the watershed because uh, easy surface material has been stripped, and so there's some nick points high up in the, the watershed, way up here, so 140 kilometers from the mouth. But this is where all the action is happening now, is that nick point area. If you have a house in the nick point area, um, or if you have visited it 10 years ago and are looking at it today, it will have changed because those nick points are moving three meters a year. So I was just telling someone that I, when I went back to take students onto the river with the help of Mark's canoeing and outing club, um, all the landings, all the DNR kind of access points to the river were just emptying into the air because the nick point had migrated past them and the river dropped in elevation. So this was a little animation probably overdone. So I talk about these uh, tributaries as unzipping into the landscape. And as they unzip into the landscape, the ravines that are leading to that part of the creek are also going to unzip. So you have this kind of progressive growth of these deep river and ravine systems into the watershed. And you can accidentally accelerate this on your own. This is a long ago photo. It actually was a photo I had to make into a slide. Um, and this was in, it was Big Stone County, I think. This farmer created a ditch that to drain his field, and that downstream end of the ditch looked like this. So you can accidentally accelerate this process just by giving extra water to the system to work with. There's a natural rate for this to happen, and there's an accelerated rate, which depends on the available water. So the natural rate exposes the, the bluffs at Yellow Medicine, of Upper Sioux community, and we have a a beautiful exposure of glacial sediment there that I visit commonly. A million years worth of glacial sediment exposed. Not everybody thinks that's pretty. They think that looks like something that needs to be fixed, but 
it, that is a natural part of landscape evolution. What's unnatural is the way we have given this watershed more water. This is the original vegetation map of the area that has been created by looking at the land surveyor records of the witness trees that were the quarter sections, and then also just notations of vegetation. They saw in the landscape. This was compiled and it's available at the DNR in county scales and also in the region. But everything that is dark yellow or blue was water held on the landscape. So probably 30% of the wetland was of the area was some kind of wetland. And I don't see Dave Pregmel here. I'd like to hear from him. If anybody knows him, I'd like to know how he's doing. But he was he cared a lot about the Minnesota River watershed, especially around Redwood Falls. And this is a photo he took early in the year before the um, tile had thawed. And it was a wet, snowy year, so there's a lot of water standing at the surface. This is probably what the landscape would look like if it weren't drained. And I've also encountered people who thought if they just moved their house a little bit and dug a new basement, they probably would have solved this problem of wetness. But there's a lot of this landscape that is just historically wet, holds water at the surface. And you know, you can appreciate probably why these prime agricultural soils, people wanted to access them. And they thought that if they drained them, that they would have access to this soil. So the wetlands were drained. I recently sat with someone at dinner who remembers as a child this machine coming through his family's farm at night with these huge lights just kind of reaching the home that he was sleeping in. But these were the ditching machines that were deployed back in the day and that are still used now to clean out the ditches. So even in places where you don't see ditches, you might see a ditch here. This is the Blue Earth watershed south of us there's still extensive alteration in the subsurface. John Chopler, a friend of mine, says this is the largest infrastructure project since the interstate highway, and you don't see it. It's invisible. You can see it in some air photographs. So this, again, is Brewer County with um, section lines for scale. Um, and you can see the stripes of the subsurface tiling that has gone in. This is a, t a machine that in places that tile. These are perforated, flexible, corrugated black pipes that are laid in with kind of like a chainsaw that buries it as it moves. And what they do is they keep the water table from ever coming up higher than the depth of the tile. So you might get rain falling on that landscape that would like to raise the water table, but it will only come up to the elevation of those perforated pipes and then moves laterally into the dish and into the stream. So in 20 minutes, a rain event that is wet in the middle of this field, well, that rain will be delivered to the out of the field, to the ditch. That's it's you work with Sue Magdalene. And if you have a low spot, you can always pump it out. So there are ways to just get rid of all the water in the upper four to six feet of the landscape. The other thing that we don't think about as changing, um, so the drainage effect on these watersheds, and these are all the watersheds, the, the major tributaries in Minnesota, the drainage effect is by far the most significant change in water delivery to the rivers. However, soybeans also play a role. So the conversion of crops from perennial vegetation like alfalfa to something that only has significant leaves for a portion of the year also delivers more water to the stream because those leaves are important for returning water to the atmosphere. And if you don't have active plant growth on the landscape, it's not doing that bit. Of returning. And then you have August when the corn is returning a lot of water to the atmosphere. And you have this extreme humidity that also changes the way weather happens out here. Um, we also have a climate effect that the nature of rainfalls has changed. You know that it's um, they're farther in between and they're bigger when they happen. This is a kind of a messy slide that I borrowed from Kevin Keener so I can fix, but it's not overlaying very well. But these are, in fact, this isn't going to work because this was a sequence, so I'm just going to go. Those wetlands in Seven Mile Creek watershed don't exist anymore. Um, that was a map of what it looked like in 1938. And now we're down to just a very small percentage of the water held on the landscape. Swan Lake still exists in that area, but we don't have very much water stored otherwise. And the other thing that I was referring to about the canoeing season on these rivers. So you might want to get out onto the water between April and June, but that actually is the scariest time to try to get onto one of these rivers. 
because if you get a little rain event, rain is the black lines coming down from the top, if you get a tiny little rain event, tenth of an inch, your stream jumps up really high, really quickly, because of the tidal drainage. And then it goes back down almost as quickly. It's also carrying a ton of mud. So you have very high sediment loads and very flashy streams. You can see that once we get leaves on the crops after mid-June, you can have big rain events and there's nothing happening in the river anymore. And that's because the crops are hijacking the water that would be delivered to the stream. You drained out that moisture that was stored in the soil, and then you have this time when you're going to be bumping your boat down on the gravel. So, talk to Mark last minute about when a good canoe trip would happen. Um, falling wind. I would say, shoot for some time in there. <laughs> it's terrifying to be there when it's a, when it's a peak stream. So, this critical time of year is coming up, this time between um, thawing of the ground and crop emergence. And that's when the landscape is most vulnerable to sediment, but also water leaving the system. And a lot of this water drains directly to rivers. This is not your watershed. This is the South Fork of the Crow. It has similar problems. Um, and what we really like to see is return of landscapes to something like this, where even when the vegetation is not green, we're still taking out the water. We did some studies down here that actually looked at specific reaches of the rivers. I know you can't read that, but this is channel width, and the blue line is channel width in um, 1938, and then we looked again in 2008. So this extra water is also widening the rivers. Some of them are twice as wide, so you can look at um, average channel width of like 50 meters here, and you see channel width of 150 meters there. So it's not your imagination that 169 is closer to the river than it used to be. It is. <laughs> and then the Great Collector, you'll hear from people in um, the Blake Path and Legacy Alliance. is It's kind of an interesting experiment we have in Minnesota because these three major watersheds all drain to Lake Heaven, and they collect Lake Heaven collects the sediment from those watersheds, and you can tell that sediment apart. I would say that it's a little compounded by the cannon and the pro looking very similar, so I kind of think in my mind as those being operating in the same way. But what we have is these watersheds in pink are only 38% of the delivery of water to Lake Pepin, but they contribute 85 to 90% of the sediment. And so this actually is shortening the life of Lake Pepin significantly. Lake Pepin is, it's an unusual lake to begin with. In fact, Minnesota has several of this kind of river lakes. I started talking about Traverse and Big Stone, and there's also Marsh Lake and Lake Carl. And then in addition to this lake, there's Lake St. Croix. They're all lakes on rivers, which is just unusual. And it's because we had this big creation of the valley event initially, and then tributaries coming in that are delivering more sediment than the river can carry away. So it backs up the river and creates this river lake. But Lake Pepin, in any event, is what used to extend all the way up to downtown St. Paul, and it has been gradually shrinking as sediment has been delivered to it over time. It's accelerated that infilling since Europeans arrived, and there's been quite a bit more sediment um, in the most recent time. So, we have documented this work with um, researchers from the St. Croix Waters at Research Station, sticking tubes into the bottom of Lake Pepin, pulling out the sediment cores, distinguishing where they're coming from, and we actually developed a method to tell where we were getting sediment from the surface fields and where we were getting it from the riverbanks. And so in addition to this total, adding the two bars together, in addition to that increasing over time, we also have a switch from field sediment to non-field sediment. This is your river widening sediment. This is your ravine growth sediment. This is you know, from the excess drainage. We still get quite a bit from the farm fields themselves. It's, it's pretty steady, but we have accelerated that non-field load. And that's just, this was supposed to appear as a flash lake. It's a progression in farming and the, the drained landscape. So this really is a story of unintended consequences. Um, you can't fault the people that are originally trying to make a living here, but you can, we can document this problem very well. We've had some of the best 
um, river scientists looking at the system, especially in the Blue Earth watershed, and we know what's happening, and we know it's not about erosion from the fields as much as access.